afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second edition of the Business and Policy Dialogue. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have with us Dr. Karan Aftar Singh, who is the chairman of the Punjab Water Regulatory and Development Authority. Uh, I will, for those of us here at ISB, uh, Dr. Singh is a very familiar person. Uh, we've had the opportunity to interact with him on numerous occasions over the past many years uh, that our campus has been here in Mohali. But I'll still uh, make a very short uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Karan uh, Aftar Singh is a member of the Indian Administrative Service of the 1984 batch. Uh, it belongs to the Punjab cadre. Uh, he took charge of as the chairman of this uh, new regulator that's been formed in the state of Punjab in July 2020. Uh, prior to that, three years preceding that, he was the chief secretary of the state of Punjab. He has held positions in various departments in the state of Punjab. Uh, and he is also a PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's an LLB graduate from the University of Delhi. Uh, and more than uh, that, I think uh, as a friend of ISB, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karan, for your time this afternoon. Uh, I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Anjal Prakash, who's the research director and the adjunct associate professor at the Bharti Institute of Public Policy at ISB. Uh, Whenever we think of water and climate change at ISB, Anjal is the person that we go to, or rather we read about his opinions in the newspaper, including this morning, uh, his, he was quoted in the Mint. Uh, so Anjal joined us uh, from Terry, where he was an associate professor prior to this. Uh, prior to Terry, he was in Kathmandu at the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. Uh, Anjal is, uh, is an alumnus of uh, TIS Mumbai, and he did his PhD from uh, Wageningen uh, University uh, and Research. So Anjul, thank you very much for agreeing to join us this afternoon. Uh, I know that we've got, uh, you know, the, as the name suggests, business and policy dialogue, the idea is to get people on both ends from the academic side and from the policy making uh, space of, on a particular subject. Uh, we are today going to be talking about groundwater development, irrigation and agrarian distress in Punjab, uh, and how do we connect the dots? Uh, this is a topic that is of interest at any given point of time, but in the light of so many other incidents, uh, so many things that are happen that have taken place in the recent past, this is you know something that is occupying national attention more so than before. Uh, and I think it makes good sense for all of us to be better informed uh, on some of these things. So we have two experts with us, and Anjul, over to you uh, to sort of get more out of uh, Dr. Karan of that. Again, Karan, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks, Guru, so much, and uh, welcome, Karan, on board. Um, this session is going to be, uh, in next one hour, we are going to explore this uh, opportunity for us to uh, have a dialogue with Karan, and this is especially in the context of uh, groundwater overdevelopment, over irrigation, and um, agrarian distress in Punjab. So we are trying to see uh, the present, uh, the chain of events which we are experiencing at this moment, uh, what are the roots of these uh, uh, things? Is there a, an agrarian distress in Punjab? And if yes, uh, what are the causes and what are the consequences of these uh, uh, changes? Uh, this is going to be in a webinar format. So we will be having a question and answer session with uh, Karan, followed by uh, uh, we'll open it up for your um, all those uh, participants who have joined us live. Uh, the way we will be form, uh, going forward is that uh, we'll have a couple of minutes 20 minutes around uh, to, to discuss directly with Karan. Uh, I have certain set of questions we'll have, which I always wanted to ask him. So it's something that we will have a dialogue, followed by another uh, 40, 50 minutes of discussion that we will, uh, will uh, a couple of minutes, we, we will open it up for your questions. Uh, this is a webinar format, so you are all muted. Um, what will happen is that you can write your questions in the Q&A uh, box, and uh, we'll, I'll pick it up those questions after the discussion finishes. So, uh, Karan, um, again, welcome back um, to the session. And uh, let me just start with this uh, question that um, I've always been there is in terms of looking at this connect that we uh, were trying to see. What is that, uh, you know, uh, we see that the groundwater has been overdeveloped in Punjab, and many areas have already been in dark zone. Uh, we also see that the Punjab uh, agriculture is largely irrigated, one of the highest irrigated um, land is in Punjab. And you also see that there is an uh, agrarian distress. Is there a connection that we see, you see, and uh, what is that connection? Yes, Anjal, it's a very interesting and deep connection. And for historic reasons, I think it gives us very rich data for 
a couple of policy experiments or perhaps hypotheses which we can test with data. So I'll take you back to 1947 when Punjab was one of the states which was partitioned in India, Bengal being the other major state. And even at that time, this part of the subcontinent was an agriculturally progressive, productive, and water intense uh, area. Uh, but after that, we've had two national regimes, one in Pakistan, one in India, with different agricultural policies, food policies, which have led to different trajectories of what we could call East Punjab and West Punjab, which is the Indian Punjab and the Pakistan Punjab. So that I think is an interesting policy research topic. Secondly, and even more interesting, is that within India, with a single set of national policies, what has been the differential impact on agriculture in different states? And here also Punjab and Haryana, uh, or the old Punjab, they stand out uh, being very different in terms of their trajectory from other states. Uh, as regards irrigation and the water crisis, we all know that, uh, you know, one of the world's largest surface irrigation projects, the Bhakra Nangal project, was uh, designed, developed by India, by Indians, constructed in what is now Himachal, Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan. It was one of India's largest prestigious projects. Uh, but if you look back at, say, now come to 1965, when uh, Punjab and Haryana were by and large surface irrigated, canal irrigation was the major source of irrigation. Uh, any kind of groundwater or underground water in, say, 1960 was extracted by mechanical, non-electrical means, such as Persian wheels, the charhat, which is the traditional Indian, North Indian way of extracting water, very beautiful, very sustainable, very friendly to the groundwater. However, after 1965, we've had three things happening in this part of the country. Uh, first was the food crisis, which hit India around that time. And remember, that was only 22 years after the Great Bengal Famine of 1942-43. So understandably, the government of India was very perturbed. These issues were raised at the international level. There was a worldwide food program, if you remember, at that time. International research institutions across from Mexico to the Philippines were researching cereals and all this helped India. It helped Punjab in particular. So we had the Green Revolution, which was a huge technological innovation and a huge adaptation by the farmers of this region, which led to historic highs in food uh, pr production growth uh, in the range of 6 to 8% per annum, which is really unheard of in agricultural economics or agricultural history. The second thing which happened around the same time was the electrification of villages in, in 65 Punjab and Haryana were one state. But even after that, both these states have been on the forefront of rural electrification. And these states had completed all village electrification, say, by 1972-73. And with that came then the adoption of uh, certain food and nutrition policies by the government, most notably the expansion of the public distribution system to all Indian citizens. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that when I was a child, everybody had a ration card. So the ration card then in, our, in my childhood, not yours, was the Aadhaar card. So what youngsters today remember as, you know, the great innovation of India being the Aadhaar card in the IT sphere, uh, the ration card and the concomitant food security, which the government provided to everybody in India was a huge step for this country. And this was supported by the MSP regime, the uh, minimum support price, which in recent events, there is a you know farmer's agitation or movement, call it what you like, and there is a dialogue with the government of India, certain states, certain political parties, everybody is reading about it in the papers. But I'm just reminding you that these issues hark back to perhaps the late 60s and early 70s. What has happened as a result is that Punjab, which never grew paddy. The only kind of rice grown in this part was basmati. Uh, Dehradouni basmati then was famous, but we all know it was grown more in what is Haryana, Karnal, and the um, Amritsar belt of Punjab. Uh, the geographical appellation today, as recognized by the International Convention, is that basmati rice is recognized as such if it is grown in the Indian states of Haryana, Punjab, Himachal, and Uttarakhand, and in certain regions of Pakistan. 
So this is the history of rice cultivation in this part of the country. But sometime in the 1970s, uh, this state became India's largest surplus grower of paddy rice. And by 1985, we could see the concomitant rapid depletion of groundwater already setting in. Uh, as I said, there were some national policies which uh, pushed this part of the country to produce paddy. There was also the state policy of subsidizing uh, agricultural pump set electric power, which made it uh, that much easier for the agriculture sector to produce uh, paddy. And today we definitely, after you know 30 odd years of this constant overuse of groundwater, uh, we've seen that every year the groundwater depletes by about one meter in terms of depth of the aquifer. And this globally, I'm told, is one of the biggest hotspots for groundwater. It, it is a big challenge. It's not going to be easy to address. It's not going to be easy to reverse. But sustainability requires that we reverse this trend. Otherwise, we are in for big problems. So do you see that uh, the present uh, distress, which is uh, you know, the agrarian distress that we see in Punjab, um, is uh, very much uh, related with the groundwater over, over development and the decline in production and other uh, associated problems. Uh, do you see a clear connect or is there some area that still needs to be established? It's a very complex situation. Um, at some point, you know, if we discuss climate change, uh, things get even more complex and chaotic. Uh, you are the expert, Anjil, but what I'm told is that with climate change, precipitation or the amount of rainfall we get in northern India will actually increase, uh, okay. which may make it more efficient to grow a crop like paddy. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we are also told that the precipitation will occur in fewer and fewer days or weeks of the year, uh, which would mean that we have to store this water somehow. It's going to be larger quantities to be stored. How we do it, it will cost us trillions of rupees uh, or even dollars, uh, however you like to measure that. And then I'm told, and this again, you're the expert, I'm sure you can guide all of us, is the, the what's going to happen to the Himalayan rivers, yeah. to the glaciers, which are uh, receding. Again, I'm old enough to pontificate on that. When I was a teenager and used to go for treks in the Western Himalaya, yeah. the glaciers I've seen now, there's only rock there. So it's been very rapid. So if in one generation or two, you can see such changes, uh, it's not as if climate change is out there in the future. It's here, it's with us, and it's very urgent. Uh, I'll start the climate change question uh, very soon, uh, uh, Karan. But uh, it's very interesting to see that the recent uh, some policy initiative which was taken by the government of Punjab has been really applauded in the especially communities dealing with groundwater, uh, especially this policy initiative which uh, enhances the uh, water security for uh, people of Punjab and the uh, Punjab uh, Water Resources uh, Management and Regulation Act, which is the 2020. Uh, this empowers the Punjab Water Regulation Development Authority, and you are the first chairperson of this authority. Uh, so, um, so this is something which has come very soon uh, in 2020 itself. Uh, my question to you is: uh, What are you? What are the vision that you have? What is? Because uh, most of the time, what we see that the regulators are there, but they don't have enough teeth to, uh, you know, uh, to take right decisions or at least direct the people to. Uh, take certain hard decisions and uh, so how what is the vision for the authority and how do we look forward to seeing this the the problems of water restored in Punjab uh, with the new law and the act that is in place so this is the first state authority in the country looking at groundwater specifically yeah. uh, the very first water authority was in Maharashtra which was a good 20 odd years back uh, because Maharashtra is addressing surface water as its bigger challenge, the Maharashtra Water Authority also has over these years addressed surface water. Uh, whereas in Punjab, our biggest challenge is groundwater. And so the act, the Punjab Water Resources Management Act of 19, 2020, which you mentioned, it mandates that uh, this authority look at groundwater on priority. And that's what we are doing. Uh, we've split our work into two parts, uh, one easy, one more difficult. We are addressing the low-hanging fruit first, which is groundwater utilized by the industrial, commercial, and urban sector. 
we've already issued our draft guidelines. Those are out for public comment. Uh, we expect objections by the 17th of December, which is in a week's time, and then we'll be going ahead and finalizing those guidelines. Uh, our guidelines are also our first in India and perhaps in for many other countries, because what we are trying to do is not only charge for groundwater extracted on a volumetric basis, that's something which any good policy or authority should do. We are also trying to put in place a regime for conserving water and providing water credits for those who conserve water. Uh, the long-term view is that we should be able to build a market for water credits. Uh, globally, there are markets for carbon credits. There are markets for other ecological services, environmental services. So these are mature markets. In fact, just yesterday, uh, the newspapers say that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has set up the world's first futures market for water. So that's a good sign. Uh, which means that there are very strong institutions uh, looking at the kind of things that we want to do in Punjab. And we are hoping that we will succeed. It will take time. And then other states and, and nationally also, we should be able to move to a system where we have water credits. We establish a water market. And ideally, if somebody saves water and earns credit, it means that if they are paying for groundwater, they should be able to, with good behavior and saving water, not only offset what they're paying, but perhaps earn some money. So, for example, if a paddy farmer, now uh, paddy in Punjab is the biggest user of water. One hectare of paddy can use about 15 cubic meters or 15, sorry, 15,000 cubic meters. It's a lot of water. Uh, and if the farmer can save even 5,000 out of that, if he's to earn those water credits at whatever they are priced, maybe two rupees a unit or five rupees, only the market can say, that's going to be a substantial earning for the farmer. And that's going to offset uh, all kinds of you know, other costs that the farmer has to bear in agricultural operations. So in the context of you know, the agricultural distress or the farmer's uh, um, agitation, which we see in some parts of the country, I think what we are looking at is a big positive. And I think uh, as a market and a country, we are ready for it. So that's uh, very interesting to see the vision that you have laid it out. Um, let me just go to the climate change question that we discussed briefly earlier. Uh, so the recent report uh, that I'm very proud to be part of was uh, this uh, special report on oceans and biosphere. And the present assessment report also, when I'm interacting with a lot of climate scientists, uh, it's very clear that the climate change is going to be uh, changing the order of the day. Uh, especially the uh, uh, Himalayan rivers, because the uh, you know uh, if you see Punjab is also very well connected with the Himalayan rivers, especially the Indus River system. Uh, so we see a lot of stress, especially because of the global warming and water regime is going to change. Um, so uh, what do you see in terms of the larger perspective uh, uh, that uh, Punjab government would have uh, in looking at the stresses that climate change is going to bring in? Um, so the, the jury is out there, Anjal, as you say, you're the expert in terms of what will happen to the Himalayan rivers with climate change. Uh, it worries us. Um, the groundwater of Punjab, the recharge, presumably, uh, I say presumably because we don't know for sure, but presumably it is from, the, from Himachal Pradesh, which is our upstream uh, region, that a lot of this water comes. Uh, our surface water regime, whether it's Bhakra Nangal, Pong Dam, Ranjit Sagar Dam, all of them are completely linked to Himalayan rivers. And if river flows change dramatically, if these storage dams, and they are the world's largest, if they become insufficient, what do we do? What would be the rupee cost of building more storage? What would be the environmental cost of building more storage how much time will it take do we have the time or you know if it's going to take 10 years to build effective storage what do we do in the intervening period so these are huge questions they go well beyond punjab or any state in india uh, these really i feel require international cooperation at a very high and intense level because india china nepal bhutan bangladesh we are all in it together we are all affected by it 
and we need to build international mechanisms which can you know join all this investment uh, garner the investment uh, spread out the benefits to all countries and citizens in a transparent and equitable manner uh, that's that's a lot of work anjal let's get down to it thank you so much uh, now the uh, the experience with the, the ground or regulation hasn't been very you know positive in india um, either you have uh, cases where people have been flaunting those laws even of they are in the in the they are the, they are not implemented in the letter and the spirit that it brings in uh, how do you intend what are the pathways that you have um, to um, come as a regulator uh, and what are the things that you one two three things that you would like to do um uh, in the first one or two years of your degree so like you mentioned there are two things anjal one of course is the law and you know what is mandated and how it is complied with uh, by people the law has evolved i feel in the right direction in india uh, the supreme court in a pil known as the mc mehta case uh, way back in 1996 had held that water in india is an asset held in public trust and why the court needed to say that is because the law in india and our constitution does not bring clarity on who is the owner of ground water is it the land owner so you know if i own an acre of land and there's ground water underneath it do i own that water if not what are my rights on that water can i use it um on the other hand some countries have declared underground water to be a national resource we haven't done that for minerals yes we know all minerals under the surface belong to the government so if in my acre of land i find some silver or gold or oil it definitely belongs to the government my only right could be some sharing or some royalty whatever the law provides so my own view is that for groundwater also uh, parliament would have to take cognizance of this problem this matter and legislate ideally in my view it should be mandated that groundwater belongs to the government as of today the supreme court which is the law of the land says that it is held in public trust which means although i may have ownership rights on the groundwater i cannot use it any which way i like there is certain regulations the national green tribunal has placed certain regulations and now state authorities like ours it is our job to regulate this in an equitable and just manner we are trying to do that like i said we put our guidelines out but like i said our other approach is the market driven approach which i think holds a lot of promise because any market driven approach is voluntary participants will come in only if they can see a win win and there is massive scope for a win win in groundwater in india in which people can get paid for good behavior for conserving water and society sees its water conserved for future generations you are definitely going to be watched for at least some years and we have a lot of people who have joined us online and there are a lot of questions which are pouring in now uh, let me just before i open it up uh, let me just ask you if there's anything that you want to inform the audience before we move to the next segment or a program where we will take questions from the audience so uh, i'd like to look at the silver lining in the cloud and i think a lot of hope especially for young people in the audience um those who like to read um i'd refer them to a book about israel so the author is uh, set siegel he's an israeli uh, with american um, you know he's educated in the us and his book is called let there be water it is a story it's a narrative about the successes and failures of israel in conserving water and i think it's it's a great book and closer to home uh, we know about chennai city and you know what wonders chennai has done after suffering so much anguish in terms of its groundwater and where it is today so if chennai can do it i think other cities metro states in india we we can do it so we have a lot of lot of questions coming from the audience let me just start uh, taking those questions and i'll try and see if we can get to some consensus and some discussion on this one so um uh, all the people who are listening to us at this point of time please do write your questions on the question and 
um, uh, answer uh, chat box and we will take each of your questions as much as possible with time permits. Let me just ask you the first question. This is by Ankit Anand and he's asking, why is the government not disincentivizing uh, the water intensive crops such as sugarcane as being grown extensively in Maharashtra? So not only from Punjab, but you know other places we see that there are uh, not many disincentives for people to uh, grow sugarcane in a water scarce places. What are your um, views on this? So, uh, Ankit, what little I know of Maharashtra, the, the Water Authority of Maharashtra has fixed bulk water tariffs for farmers. As you know, in Maharashtra, most of the water comes from canals and tanks and river projects. There's very little groundwater, and so farmers are paying for it. Uh, but I think your question, it, it aims at you know, the issue of why do not farmers conserve water more effectively when they grow a crop? You know, they, they may grow paddy, they may grow sugar cane. Uh, we, we need sugar. Uh, you know, we are an undernourished country. We are still not at that happy situation where most people are obese, except maybe, you know, in, in your and mine income group, we have some obesity, but most Indians are undernourished. We need that sugar and paddy. Uh, yes. So how do you conserve water when you're growing sugarcane and paddy, given that we need this uh, food? Uh, looking at other countries, I find it's not easy. So I can be glib and say, like, if we charge more for the water, presumably farmers will conserve it, but that may not suffice. Uh, again, I would say that if we can show people the benefit of conserving water, and give them a financial security, by which I mean a tradable slip of paper. It may be worth only two rupees or five rupees, but I think it nudges behavior amongst everybody. And it gives you a sense of pride, right? If you're a farmer growing 10 acres of sugarcane, if somebody comes and on your mobile phone gives you a credit of even 1,000 rupees because you've saved water, uh, farming is very hard work, you know, standing six months. In fact, sugarcane takes one year to grow. It's not a six month crop. Sorry. Uh, standing there for a year in the heat and the cold, in the sun and the shade, in the winter and the summer. Uh, I don't know Ankit, if you've done farming. I come from a family. My grandfather was a farmer. I don't think I'm tough enough to do it. So it's a tough job. On top of that, we want them to save the water. I think we should give everybody a little incentive. Uh, it can be done. And it is. There are progressive farmers in Maharashtra. You can go to Jalgaon. Uh, Jain Irrigation from Jalgaon was the uh, instigator, I would say, or the innovator. But now farmers have just taken it up on their own. And the, the aggressive way that they save water in that area, it's, it's a social movement there. Every farmer takes pride in saving water. Yeah, so, and I'm, so that's, uh, I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, there are a lot of questions, so I'm going to quickly, uh, you know, just um, uh, take them. So, Balshir uh, Sidhu, he uh, is asking a question about farmers in Punjab, which uh, he says that has forgotten, has become accustomed to um, paddy wheat cycle, and no one can blame them since government policy promised that. that. So, the shift away from paddy wheat, uh, is there an option apart from competing, uh, compensating farmer for any loss that they, they incur? Yes, there are many options. Um, so paddy, as I said, is a non-traditional crop. Yeah. The alternatives could be maize or corn, uh, soybean, other pulses, oil seeds, cotton. Uh, Punjab is a good cotton growing region. So these are alternatives. There are price and incentive issues, but they're very much there. And I think they'll happen, maybe slowly at first, but yes. Okay, so Noor Kumar is having a very interesting question. She's asking in what ways in which new bill different is different from the Punjab Groundwater Control Regulation uh, and uh, Control and Regulation Act, which is of 1998, and uh, which was observed to be too harsh on users and uh, not in the large interest of the farmers. How is it different, the new one? Yeah, so the new act sets up an independent regulator. That's the biggest difference. And the regulator uh, may issue directions only after firstly seeking objections and hearing all affected parties. So the regulator sits separately from government. 
and is supposed to take objective decisions. And of course, like every regulator, these decisions can be adjudicated in the High Court or the Supreme Court. Uh, so there's going to be more transparency, more scrutiny of whatever we do. Okay. There's a follow-up question on your talk, uh, you know, when you mentioned about Israel. The question is, uh, how are we, uh, any learning that from Israel or Singapore that we are able to adapt for uh, the present scenario in Punjab? What are the learnings that we have? Uh, the biggest learning is uh, how to recycle and reuse water. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my mandates, uh, which we will address after we've been through the groundwater issue, because that is most urgent. The second mandate is to set tariffs for urban water supply and water treatment. And it would be good if we could see perhaps in three to four years time, that all the wastewater in Punjab in urban areas is treated and reused for irrigation. We may not be able to reuse it for drinking. That's very expensive. Singapore does it. Israel also does it in part. But we have a huge demand for irrigation water, so it could be well utilized for irrigation. There's another question of, uh, is, uh, are there any scheme um, in, in Punjab that encourages participatory groundwater management? and uh, that involves directly the farmers uh, into the management and regulation of groundwater. That's a very good question. Is, are there any vision around this? Yes. Um, and th this is an old scheme. It runs in uh, the northern districts along the Himachal Pradesh uh, border in the sub-mountain area. Uh, there used to be a World Bank aided project known as the Integrated Watershed Management Project. This was a national project. Punjab was part of it. And as part of that, in that water scarce part of the state, uh, water users groups were set up at the block and village level. They are, they are successful. They are running now. They manage common deep bores. So a group of, say, 50 to 100 farmers has one deep bore well, which is otherwise very expensive to put, and they manage it collectively. In the rest of the state, unfortunately, in agriculture, we don't have much common um, management. But for drinking water, we do. Practically every village in Punjab has a drinking water management committee, which manages the local drinking water scheme. They collect their bills voluntarily from among, amongst themselves and operate and manage the schemes. So there was an old, uh, uh, you know, uh, plan program, which is Pani Bachao Paisa Kamao program, which was quite popular, actually. So a question is, what is the future of this kind of program in the light of the new law that we have here? So I, I hope it has a great future because it is, again, one of the first programs in the country which pays people for good behavior. I, I remember when I was a youngster, I had joined the service and started working for government. And there was this, so I'm, say, I'm talking of 1988, right? when some of you were not born. So I was asked about the subsidy which for electricity, which farmers get in Punjab. And one person remarked that, you know, subsidies are okay, but you should give them for doing the right thing, not for doing the wrong thing. And the implication was that if you subsidize electricity uh, and it is used for overexploiting the water, that is the wrong thing. And if you pay somebody to save water, that would be the right thing. So the Pani Bachao Paisa Kamao scheme does precisely that. Uh, I'm told it runs in only about 3 to 4% of the villages in Punjab because it's a pilot scheme. But I'm also told it has succeeded as a pilot and uh, that it will be rolled out in the whole state. And we will definitely support it in whatever way we need to. Okay, very good. Uh, Pumkum Das Gupta, she's a journalist who writes on water, environment, climate issues and very well known. She's written very many uh, pieces and very interesting <laughs> Uh, she's asking if um, uh, groundwater is made a natural resource, as you said, uh, how would you help uh, farmers in minimizing friction and also ensuring equitable distribution? Um, yeah, good question. It'll take a longish answer, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, clarity in property rights, in my view, always helps every stakeholder. Uh, at present, we don't have clarity. Uh, once there's clarity, and I may be wrong because I'm advocating that the nation or the state should own the water, but suppose it does, then the parliament or the state legislature can 
clearly specify which citizen will have what right to which part of the water. And so your rights and duties become much clearer. So whether it is conserving the water, whether it is treating wastewater, reusing it, we'll have much more clarity. And then the markets will open up. If we want investment, say, in treatment of urban wastewater, it will be easier if the ownership and rights on water are very clear to the investors. Okay. Let me bring and in this will be colleague. better for farmers yeah. also. Yeah. yeah. Let me bring in my colleague, Aditya Dhar. Dr. Dhar uh, is uh, my colleague here at IFB. Uh, uh, Aditya, would you like to also answer this question, looking at, you know, Kumkum's question, very interesting question. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is a very important question about how, uh, you know, if groundwater is a national resource, what is the role of the state, I suppose, to minimize the risk? I think one big problem that comes up is sort of because groundwater comes from aquifers, even though, let's say, I own a land which might have water underneath me, it's also responsible for water somewhere else. You know, this issue of externalities is very, very critical. I, uh, as an economist, I do, um, I suppose, echo Dr. Singh's view that uh, some delineation of property rights uh, uh, is important. Uh, but uh, I'm also reminded that the work of Leonard Ostrom, the Nobel, suggests that there is uh, quite a deal that can be achieved even when resources are not individually owned but collectively owned. Um, so I, yeah, I, I guess the, the short answer to the Kumkum's question is I don't know. Um, and I think this tension between collective ownership versus individual ownership, uh, you know, may need to be resolved. They may not necessarily have to be like one solution for the state. Um, you know, why it mean, you know, in some pockets you could have individual, in some pockets you could, I mean, you could have collective. So instead of the common one size fits all policy, if the solution is uh, tailored to the local uh, context, which could be a collect group of villages, a group of panchayats, that might be better chosen, as Dr. Singh was mentioning earlier. If there's ownership in those local villages at the end of the day, if this power is devolved, uh, to the local level on which they can decide their own future and own uh, uh, and you know own thing. I think that might help uh, you know achieve the consequences, at least the vision that Kumkum is talking about. Okay, thanks, uh, Aditya. Uh, Nagroon is asking uh, whether drinking water should be kept out of the market uh, scenario, as you are mentioning. So, uh, what are your views on this? Um, yeah. You have a point. Uh, again, I'll you know just mention a Supreme Court uh, ruling, which is the law of the land, uh, which says that the right to drinking water is subsumed in the right to life under Article 21 of our Constitution. Uh, if if you take that further, it would imply that the state, the government, has an obligation to provide every citizen with sufficient, good quality drinking water since it's part of the right to life, as the Supreme Court says. So to that extent, yes, if it becomes an obligation of the state, then it can't be left to the market. Yeah. Okay, Winnie Munjal from Delhi, she has a very good uh, question. She's asking, uh, can you tell us about two, three solutions you propose to achieve uh, agriculture, water, use efficiency in Punjab? What are the two, three things that you would propose? Okay. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, without going into specifics, if we can give farmers a water credit, say if we can give every farmer two rupees for every cubic meter of water saved as compared to a bench line consumption, say of 2018. Mm -hmm. And if we can measure that and we can build a system of tradable securities, water credits, I think it's feasible. Uh, the money is there in the system. Uh, where the money could come from? Well, uh, the state gives about 6,000 crores of electricity subsidy to the agriculture sector. Uh, when a farmer saves water, groundwater, he doesn't use the electricity. So that money becomes available for water credits. This is, in a sense, the Pani Bachao Pesa Kamao scheme, which has been a pilot for two years. So, so it's possible. Yeah. 
So another question that comes from Noor is uh, uh, about the uh, learning that we have from other states. Uh, and there are many states where which has experimented on groundwater reg regulations. Do you see any parallels which is which you can draw from other states? So I, I mentioned Maharashtra and Jalgaon, um, Gujarat, Rajasthan. There have been uh, good practices uh, which can be replicated in other states, um, definitely. Yeah, okay. On the bill also, again, there's another question is in terms of uh, uh, what are the provisions to ensure decentralization of power and decision-making? So that's something uh, a lot of people have questions in terms of centralized uh, decision-making process and uh, what do you think about this in the bill? How do we ensure that there's a uh, So uh, the the act, if you read it, it envisages a state level water management plan mm -hmm. and block level water management plan. So every panchayat samiti would have to prepare its block level plan, and then all those would get agglomerated into a state level plan. So there would be participation at the panchayat samiti level. And as you know, every gram panchayat sarpanch is a member of the panchayat samiti. So in some sense, every village gets to be represented. Yeah, okay. So Arvind Padi is here and um, I know him personally, they, uh, you know, they're doing a very good job and he's asking a question. Uh, there are a few examples to raise, uh, to raise irrigation water productivity in specific crops uh, that, is, uh, that is acceptable to, uh, to the political economy. So what are the examples that we have, uh, if you could just um, focus on this? So come again, Anjal. Aditya's question is about examples in for saving water. Uh, yeah, Arvinda's question is that few examples to raise irrigation water productivity. So very few of them um, yeah. that uh, that mm. has us, you know, so related to crop productivity. So uh, is there is there is there something that I'm sure you have, I think you've dealt anyway about water use efficiency earlier. But in terms of uh, saving water and then increasing water productivity. This whole uh, Israel question is also in terms of, yeah, so that, how do we dwell in Yes, that? yes. Yes, Aditya. This is linked to the first question by Ankit on sugarcane, but let me focus on paddy. The water efficiency in paddy cultivation in India is quite poor. Uh, our water efficiency is only about half that of China. So for every cubic meter of water, China produces twice as much as rice as we do. So we have a long way to go. And there are specific practices uh, linked to, uh, so given the variety that you're growing, uh, firstly, there's a lot of scope for introducing better and new varieties uh, in every state in India, which are more suited to the climate conditions. But given you've done that, then the time of sowing and what is known as the wet dry method of irrigation of paddy. Indian farmers go wet, wet. They keep paddy flooded throughout the 90 day, practically throughout the 90 day cultivation cycle. Whereas productivity of the field of the land and of the water, we are told is much higher if you go wet, dry. So you save half the water, you get more paddy. Uh, this is something which we need to train and extend across the country. Okay. Yeah, there are similar ways, similar questions also asked in terms of uh, efficiency questions, but Dhanpal has a question which uh, he's asking, is there any groundwater recharge conservation program that increases the water uh, for, you know, um, availability in the state? So Punjab or any other places that you think there's, a, there's any recharge program which is going on? Yes, um, so the groundwater recharge structures in Punjab are basically along the canals and the drains. Uh, the rivers being very big in Punjab, they tend to have their own deeper groundwater recharge ecosystem. So we don't interfere with that. But along the canals and the small drains, uh, we have built uh, groundwater recharge structures. They are difficult to maintain because of the very high level of siltation that happens in this part of the country. So that's a challenge. Uh, in, in five to 10 years, these recharge structures, they need practically complete rebuilding because of desiltation. So the systems of price intensification, these experiments have happened. Uh, and and uh, I know Punjab also has many experiments. There's some, is there any uh, thing that we can draw as uh, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, positive experiment, uh, 
experiences that you had personally uh, looking at SRIs and that saves how much water it saves and also increases productivity. Any thoughts on this? Hmm. Good. <laughs> so you put me on the mat, Anjali. <laughs> so these are questions yeah, but, coming uh, from the audience. <laughs> I'm just directing them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so, so farmers in Punjab are very innovative, and and the variance in their water efficiency is astounding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we could just pick the best farmers and show all the others how to do it, uh, I think we can save half the water, <laughs> and that solves the groundwater problem really. <laughs> Okay, Pratap has an interesting question again. Uh, he's asking uh, that climate change is going to bring in a lot of uncertainty in uh, surface and groundwater in situation in the state. However, there is a human angle to this as well. People whose livelihood is dependent on these water resources will also be affected. How does the government go about uh, about future proofing jobs such as agrarian jobs in the state? Uh, has there any uh, been any thinking on policy circles around this? Stuff? This is something which is probably a so, large issue. Yeah. 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 This is, yeah, it's it's a great question, Pranav, long term. So, but to be frank, uh, my knowledge is that, you know, the government's uh, strategy on climate change is more short term, more immediate. Uh, for example, in agriculture, it is uh, centered around climate resilience of the crops and making sure that our food security is not adversely affected uh, with climate change in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, the other downstream effects on the economy and on jobs, um, I don't think we have clarity on that, frankly. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jashbir, uh, Jashinder B. Singh, yeah, he's uh, having another question. He's asking if uh, uh, water conservation has been done using uh, rainwater harvesting, if that can be done uh, and uh, this we may uh, make water reservoirs and issues around credit uh, to the contributors. So, is there anything um, done in Punjab which has some successes uh, in terms of rainwater harvesting? Oh yes, Jashin. Uh, as you know, in urban Punjab, uh, if you have a house or a building on a plot more than 500 square yards, then a rainwater harvesting structure is mandatory. So if you're making a new building, you have to make the rainwater harvesting structure. In addition, in the larger cities, in the municipal corporations now, uh, the local bodies are planning stormwater uh, recharge. So as you know, only a small fraction of the total rainwater gets harvested in houses or commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. A major portion is on uh, the streets and public lands, which where you need to conserve it. So that, that's a new area. And, and we in the authority also, we would encourage and uh, to the extent funds allow us, subsidize uh, urban local bodies which go for stormwater harvesting. Okay, so um, Arbind Padi has a follow-up question. He's asking if uh, how solarization uh, could help in sustainable water management technologies. I guess he means by the solar. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, wonderful, Aurobindo. Uh, yes, uh, that's again a great thing to do early days. I think it'll happen quickly in India. Uh, so most states in India subsidize agricultural power to the farmer. Uh, one way to make the farmer a participant and an entrepreneur in the energy sector is to give her or him a solar power plant. Um, so if there is a solar power plant in the village and all the farmers have equity in it, they can use the power either to pump out water themselves or they can sell the power. So you get the financial incentive straight away to conserve the water. So I think that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Okay, there's another question uh, which comes, which asks, is asking for steps that have been taken to help farmers in terms of innovation and induction of new technologies optimizing groundwater use. So any uh, thing that if not taken, if you have anything in your mind, which uh, will be helpful for uh, us to think for. So yeah, one thing which is new is the internet of things. And uh, it's already being tried in India. There are startups doing it. There are governments uh, supporting it. The Punjab Agriculture University has started 
demo uh, plots. Uh, it's fairly simple. It's not very expensive. So you can, um, so on the one hand, you would have a flow water meter on the tube well or the canal source. On the other hand, you would have soil moisture meters in say in every one acre of land. Mm -hmm. And you would optimize the irrigation on your, on your land, depending on which crop you grow. So what the agriculture university doing is doing is to figure out the exact, uh, you know, it's an upper and lower uh, uh, limit, yeah. which is the ideal lower limit of moisture in the soil when for paddy you need to re-irrigate. What is the maximum moisture at which you should stop irrigation? And so when you fix these limits appropriately, you should be able to conserve a lot of water. Okay, I'll, let me just bring in Aditya also. Aditya is, uh, yeah, um, um, if you could just dwell upon it slightly more, yeah. Uh, on that specific question, um, I don't know what more to say. I did want to actually take a step back and ask on the larger, because I think one of the things that has, that has come across in your vision, if I may say so, is this idea of using a market-based approach. And you've mentioned that a couple of times, it finds, you know, it's mentioned in um, the work that's been happening in the government already with the RCT, with JPL, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we have, and I think this is a broader question for regulators in India. You know, we, they, you know, there are a lot of, I suppose, provisions and guidelines that they can issue. But in terms of uh, the penalties that can be levied in case of non-compliance, uh, for instance, you mentioned, you know, you have this, you know, fantastic idea that we divide up the state into three different zones based on the zoning. There is, you know, different requirements, different charges being done, uh, and it all requires metering. Um, but if that is not uh, acceptable or that is not happening, you know, what teeth does a regulator have? Um, that is, I guess, one question. Uh, and I think it also is linked to a second question, which is in the Q&A as well, which is how does a regulator maintain an arm's distance from the government, um, which might be prone to some, you know, populist measures or so and so forth. So, you know, generally speaking, not just from the state of point of view of Punjab, but if you can speak from a Punjab experience, that would be wonderful. Uh, but in general, the question of you know, the lack of teeth that regulators have uh, in the Indian context when it comes to conservation of environment resources. So, if you could elaborate a little bit about on that, thank you. So, okay, two questions. One is the teeth or the lack of teeth. Uh, that is evolving. Um, many states like Punjab and Maharashtra are setting up regulators and the law does provide some, uh, you know, directory um, powers. And the law as enunciated by the Supreme Court and the National Green Tribunal is also evolving uh, in the direction of giving, uh, you know, powers to either to the state governments or to the pollution control boards or the regulators. So that is an evolution. Yes, it may be slower than what you may like. Uh, the, the second uh, question Aditya was of, uh, that's an institutional question. The first one was legal and that was of transparency, independence, um, autonomy of a regulator. I think there are two sides to it. Uh, there is one side that when you set up an independent regulator, who will regulate the regulator? So, you know, when institutions are new uh, without customs, precedents to guide them, um, how do we go about it, uh, especially in the first 10 or 20 years? And, and the second is that if the regulator has to be effective, it needs to be seen by the people as autonomous, independent, transparent, and that again is a is a building process. It's a slow process. So so I guess this narrative is new in India. The electricity regulators, by and large, have done well, and I think their relative success has now made people in India, whether policymakers or the public, a little more comfortable with regulators than they were, say, thirty years back. Uh, so so perhaps the time has come when a regulatory bodies. Uh, need to mature and show that they can regulate themselves also. And, and B, the people seem to be more willing to accept that 
whether it is toll roads and you know regulation of the tolls whether it is water or electricity or any other utilities or goods uh, that regulators can function with a fair degree of autonomy and transparency in india i hope i hope it works that way it's early days so um, okay so now and, and we'd we'd love to hear yeah we'd love to hear from anybody on how a regulatory body can improve its transparency and autonomy okay uh, the the maharashtra water regulator has in my view done fairly well in this regard so that's a good story so we are almost closing uh, at the closing time for our discussion uh, let me just ask you a final question and then i'll go to aditya just to summarize one or two three key takeaways that you have and i'll come to current for last word the question is how does authority uh, like yours uh, intends to engage with academic institutions so there are different academic institutions uh, uh, like isb and a lot of other uh, you know universities and all so what are your plans to um, to work with the, with the with academic institutions and uh, and the way forward to seek some solutions which are shared so we are uh, talking to our you know uh, to the leading institutions in our region which of course isb is the first and then we are also talking to iit roper uh, and you may know iit roper has been granted a fairly big grant by the department of science and technology government of india it runs into 100 crores or more on water technology so they reached out to us and we are very happy to you know co cooperate with them and see how we can uh, get the best out of them from our point of view uh, which would be for example on the internet of things that i just mentioned uh, iit roper is is working on that and they of course have their own agenda uh, which i find is a very ambitious agenda so they feel in the next 3 years they should be able to come up with very cost effective technology solutions for northern india Uh, for improving water efficiency and of course we are talking to our state agriculture university the punjab agriculture university a uh, couple of things they are doing uh, for us uh, and we hope to expand this uh, interface with academic institutions uh, here and uh, across the country across the globe yeah, that's very good to know and uh, i think there are a lot of academicians also yeah. students as well uh, and in the in the participants group today and i'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of people who will reach out to us and we'll direct them to you as well uh aditya uh, any take home messages that you would have uh from uh, yeah so uh, yeah i think uh, from a take home message point of view i just want to make one follow up request uh, you know to to uh, to dr singh and this is not i mean we you know isb has been working with the authority very closely so we haven't had this issue but on behalf of uh, other academic institutions i think as you rightly pointed out uh, punjab stands out in a close collaboration with state universities and part of the success of punjab's agricultural uh, um, you know success story has been uh, by the immense amount of work that's happened in you know uh, by 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 public institutions um, so in that spirit uh, you know uh, on behalf of other institutions who are you know attendees in, in you know in the audience i also want like there's two 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 main suggestions i suppose to make one is if uh, you know the authority could have uh, you know some social media presence um so they can you know um make their you know guidelines make their you know minutes and things sort of more publicly available so people can you know comment on many of these things which i mean is already happening in the public sphere but kind of sort of i think i'm asking for greater you know uh, you know communication uh, and the second thing would be on many of the instances uh, you know uh, researchers working in this area have access to good amount of data so that's 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 perfectly fine uh, but there are still you know journalists there's still you know other 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 academics who are looking for access to open data so as the as the authority continues to you know foray uh, into this uh, into this uh, you know uh, into punjab's groundwater you know uh, landscape whatever information uh, that is being compiled you know it could be even like applications being submitted you know for as in for approvals if all of those things can be made you know more available publicly 
then it will, I think it will create an ecosystem where anybody, not just select institutions, but pretty much anybody from any part of the state can come and click download and then you know provide feedback uh, for the regulator. So I think um, a greater call for uh, open access and more more communication and transparency is what I would you know uh, as a final thought just kind of. Thanks, Aditya. Yeah. With this thoughts, I'll over to you, Karan, for your thirty second closing remark. Thank you. Um, I think Punjab and you know my regulatory authority, we have embarked on a very exciting journey. It's very challenging. And we look forward to huge developments in India in terms of the you know national policies for water conservation and hopefully a national market for water and for conserving it. Thank you. And thanks so much, Karan. Uh, so audience, we try to connect today between the groundwater overdevelopment, the uh, intensive agriculture that uh, Punjab is facing and the farmers' uh, distress or the stress that they are going through at this moment. Uh, we try to connect the dot, looking into slightly more deeper into where the, uh, the problems may lie. Uh, lie. So uh, this has been an interesting uh, startup for us uh, of a discussion, which I'm sure will go slightly more longer way. Uh, so this is this. I close this uh, program, but I over to you, uh, Kumar, uh, for your final words. <clears throat> thank you very much, Anjal, and uh, thank you for anchoring this session so beautifully and for getting these uh, you know questions conveyed to Dr. Singh. Uh, but uh, to Dr. Karan Aftar Singh, I want to express my sincere thanks uh, for not just taking time out to be here with us this afternoon, uh, but more importantly, sort of to your response. Uh, to Aditya's question about, you know, how uh, as a regulator, as as an authority, and you are the first, uh, you know, authority in this state, uh, and there are sort of ways in which you can set the uh, direction and sort of make it easier for academics and for people who want to do more work in this uh, space, especially to collaborate, you know, and the idea is to sort of, you know, co-create uh, so that there's greater sort of, you know, work in this area. Uh, and I think your response has been very, very positive. We know for a fact as ISB, uh, you know, that it's always been like that. Uh, one of the things that I did mention earlier, uh, I, I described Dr. Singh as a friend of ISB. Uh, when we first set up the campus here, uh, or when we were talking about setting up the campus here in 2009-10, uh, we spoke to a few people and we said, you know, we are setting up a campus in Mohali. And one of them who's from our partner school uh, said, you know, you should meet Dr. Karan Avtar Singh. Uh, if you, in whoever you meet or not, you should meet him and take his help. And uh, over the years, uh, we've actually collaborated uh, when you were principal secretary industries, uh, uh, the, the sort of prestigious progressive Punjab was uh, done here under your leadership and so on. So we look forward to continued association uh, and to our participants who've joined in uh, today, uh, thank you very much. I noticed Dr. Padi was there as well. Uh, Dr. Padi, we should get you on one of the future uh, dialogues here. Uh, I, I saw Mr. Janardhan Reddy as one of the participants. So many of you, uh, but thank you very much. And to everyone who's tuned in, uh, thank you for your participation.